Hello and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to uh, the next installment of the Lightning Lunch sessions. Today, we will be looking at uh, the biodiversity behind your uh, food plate. And I am joined here today by Stefano Mariani from uh, Biology and Zoology here at our JMU. If this is the first session that you're joining, then welcome. We do have loads more sessions coming up, including another session by Stefano in a couple of days. For those of you who have never used Zoom before, we cannot see or hear you, so you can just sit back and relax. There will be an opportunity to ask questions either using the Q&A tab that you will be able to see on Zoom, or if you're watching on demand in the future, you will be able to either email outreach at lgmu.ac.uk or by getting in contact with our admissions team at courses at lgmu.ac.uk. Today's session will last approximately 20 to 25 minutes and will be directed by Stefano. So without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hand it over to Stefano. Well, thank you so much, Ben. And uh, really uh, a pleasure to be here and experiencing this new uh, way of, uh, of communicating uh, science. Um, I am today, uh, yeah, I decided to, to talk about one of the branches of my um, research um, and the one that particularly focuses on, on seafood, uh, but in its broader sense, in how the seafood that we are surrounded by um, are under, underlain and, and, and constituted by a wide range of biodiversity. Um, you can see this is a, an interesting uh, picture taken from a food stall in fact, this was the, the Armdale Center in, in Manchester. And, um, and it, you know, it's probably something that some of you will be familiar, but I wonder, and I constantly wonder about this, that whether when we look at this food, when we look at these animals, do we actually think about them as pieces of food, as the, 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 the main matter that constitutes our dinner on that day, or on that week? Or, or do we think about their life history, their ecology? Where are they? Where, where do they come from? And how are they doing? What they do when they are alive? And I have always been fascinated by this. Um, and I want to tell you more about this today. Now, some of you might actually ask, oh, Stefano Mariani, he is a professor of biodiversity, of marine biodiversity at Liverpool John Morris University. Uh, it, is this what every marine biologist does? I mean, like, you know, thinking about what we eat, what, what fish we eat. Well, it, it's not really. I mean, I, as a marine biologist, I fell in love with live animals that swim in the sea. And, and this is, I also get I'm particularly very lucky and privileged uh, to, to also carry out a number of different other research projects, uh, including going at sea, diving or snorkeling and going on boats and studying uh, animals in their environment. But um, there is something that we have to admit and acknowledge, and it is that humans have consumed animals that live in the sea for, for millennia. And uh, I am, as you can tell probably from my accent, I am Italian, I'm from Rome, and, and these are mosaics that most of them are actually from Pompeii, the archaeological site that are very famous across the world uh, because a lot of things have been preserved under the ashes of the volcano eruption. And, and in many parts of Pompeii, but also everywhere else in Italy, you find Roman mosaics that are over 2,000 years old and, and tell stories about food and natural history. And, some of the fish that you see here actually are easily identifiable Mediterranean fish. So the ancient Romans knew their fish very well, in part because they were interested in the natural world, but also because they were extremely passionate about eating food. And you find this all across the world, from South Africa to Alaska to Australia, Japan, South America, everywhere in the world, we have a long-standing tradition of eating fish. It's part of our nature. But as biologists, we want to make sure that this fish-eating habits are also uh, compatible with the way we want to preserve the oceans. So a little outlook 
and it's important to look at this, is that it, this, these are statistics from the food and agriculture organizations of the United Nations, and they map the amount of productions of fish that have occurred. And this data have come from 1950, as you can see along the X axis, you have an increase on the Y axis, you have the millions of tons of seafood produced in the world. And you can see, obviously, it goes up and it goes up and it goes up. So from 20 million tons, we are now at nearly 180 million tons. Okay, so it's almost six times as it was 70 years ago. So the fish production continues. But what is this fish production coming from? As you can see, there is a big chunk of it is orange, and that represents the wild fish that is caught. And up until the 1990s, it was by far the majority of the fish that we were eating and producing. It was fish that was wild, coming from wild populations across the sea, primarily. Only a small percentage here in dark red, you see, comes from freshwater live caught fish. But then something happens from the 90s onwards there is a, a clear increase of this blue segment. The blue segment represents aquaculture, which is essentially the, the, the aquatic version of, uh, of farming, because some of the species could be domesticated in recent decades, and now they are constantly farmed. And they are uh, farmed in different ways. The majority of them are actually farmed uh, from fresh water, but quite a good chunk now are farmed in, in marine water like salmon and sea bream and sea bass. Uh, the, you have here up here a carp to represent the freshwater aquaculture. And here you have a haddock that represents the wild capture. You can see that ever since aquaculture became more important, there hasn't been a significant increase in production of wild capture, which means that we are kind of reaching a point where it's more convenient to actually farm the fish, but there is still half of all the proteins that we eat are coming from wild animals. And this is a major difference between eating animal protein from land and eating animal protein from water. On land, essentially, we have five to 20 species, I mean, yes, up to 20, because yes, there are also farmed ostriches, some uh, farm um, crocodile or cr farm kangaroo in some situation, but these are very, very small and, and, and peculiar and small scale because the vast majority of proteins we produce from land are chicken, cattle, pigs, sheep. And, and these animals, let's remember, these animals in mass, if you were to to put them together, all the chicken and cows and pigs that are produced by humans on land, they would be more, they would weigh more, far more in fact, than all the wild animals that exist on the planet. So this is how major our impact has been, where we have completely transformed the biomass on this planet because we are now basically have a planet that is primarily, you know, constituted by a biomass that is that is artificial and produced by us. At sea, instead, you can show, these are just a couple of pictures, a couple of snapshots. The top one from an Italian fish market, and the bottom one from a from a British one. In fact, the bottom one is from the famous Birmingham Bullring fish market. And you can count if you want. You can count afterwards if you want. But there are, even in just these two pictures from these two fish stalls, there are over 25 species of animals. And that is the great difference, because actually, sea food is constituted by thousands of species, thousands of species of fish. And then to that, you can add all the mollusks, all the different shelled organisms, crustaceans, shrimps, mussels, etc. So. It's a, it's a remarkable difference. It's a remarkable difference. And, and we should also consider that there is, this is a study that has been recently uh, basically uh, covered in the media as well. And actually one of my colleagues at LJMU was a co-author of this study. We have, uh, they have estimated that only 3%, 3% of the land masses on our planet are intact. 
And in fact, you can see them here in purple. So there are only patches in, in the Arctic, tiny patches in the Amazon, tiny patches in the middle of the desert, and everything else is not intact. We have completely transformed. In fact, the majority of the planet you can see in gray is where complete extinctions of animals have occurred since the 1500s. So there is very little pristine world, but the sea, as much as we have to acknowledge that it has been impacted by it, has been destroyed, is not being taken care of appropriately in many cases, it's still the part of our ocean that is less destroyed, that is less damaged, that is less transformed, and also the part of the planet where the better chance of progress and improvement is still, still possible. So let's not disregard the food that is produced from the sea because it's actually going to have less impact in many cases than any food that is produced on land. So uh, to go back to the ancient Romans, to go back to the fact that we want to talk about a bit of biodiversity that underpins our food. What, what, what is he meaning? You know, biodiversity under my food. This is a dinner plate. There's some food. Where is the biodiversity? Well, the, bi the biodiversity is actually the fish species that come from the boat onto the processing plant, into the packaging, into a supermarket or the fishmonger. We recently published a study where we showed the population of Europeans in, from six different European cities. We showed the pictures of the six fish. Now, I'm not going to put anyone on the spot here, but why don't you just look at this fish and try to see whether you, you, you can identify some of them. These are six among the most commercially widespread and popular fish that are available across Europe. And yet, um, we have found from the study that from the six countries, cities from Italy, Greece, Spain, the United Kingdom, Belgium, and Ireland, basically the average consumer barely, barely recognized two out of six species. And that tells us two things. The first thing is that we start from a position of knowing very little, because if we cannot properly identify even the very, very famous popular fish that come onto our plate, then what's going to happen with all the thousands that are less, that are more obscure, that we don't know that they are imported from uh, somewhere in the Indian Ocean or the Caribbean? We just don't know enough about our food. And it's not good because obviously food security is a major challenge for our future. It will be interesting in the, year to come, in the years to come to investigate more about comparing coastal places with, with urban areas or comparing different regions of the world uh, and compare whether uh, and perhaps seeing whether the consumers better understanding and knowledge and literacy about the diversity of fish that are consumed perhaps can escalate some improvement in the way fish are sustainably caught and managed and provided. In the meantime, you can see the names have appeared. So actually you can check if you had um, got some of these names right. Now, let alone the images of the fish when they are whole, what about when they are filleted? That's the real problem. In many parts of the world, including Great Britain, the fish are mostly traded and presented to the consumers as fillets. Now, these three fillets, only very expert fish biologists would tell them apart and would probably have an educated guess of what they may be. But the average consumers obviously would have no idea. That's why, how can we uh, track all these fillets that are, uh, that are traded constantly on a daily basis across the globe. Seafood, seafood, let's remember, is the most widely globally traded commodity in the world. I mean, the legal one, when it's legal, because as we know, with the results of illegal trade in fish, in fish products. But yeah, these are three completely different 
species and uh, some of them you know the one to the left is a snapper from the caribbean the middle one is a deep water fish from the north atlantic from cold waters and the, the one to the right is the nile perch which is produced coming from the river nile and it's produced in east africa and then it's been also exported uh, in other parts of the world well in my lab and in other labs of course but um, we are using the most elegant biological solution to understand this biodiversity, especially when it's visually difficult to identify. And this is, and I refer to, to, the, to the DNA. A DNA is the blueprint of life in every life form on this planet. And small molecules of DNA can be extracted from everything. From a fly, from a fly that is in your room now, your own hair, your own swab to check if there is DNA of coronavirus, for example, and from a flower and from the hair of your cat or your dog, DNA is everywhere. Okay. So if we take a fillet of fish and we extract the DNA, now we have very, very agile, nimble, effective technology. And this picture shows you how effective and reliable this technology is. This is my PhD student, Andika, who is in that picture in a landing site in Indonesia. He is studying the illegal trade of sharks. And what you see in the background, all these bits and, and pieces and fragments, you can see small, tiny fragments of fins and vertebrae of sharks that have been dried and they have been packaged in this sack, in these big bags. Now he is conducting an analysis using a few pipettes, a few tubes. This red machine behind it is a PCR machine that amplifies the DNA and detects it. So nowadays, you don't even need a full equipped, equipped lab to do DNA testing. So by doing these things, and I actually really suggest you follow not just the, at the Mariani lab on Twitter, but I actually suggest you to also follow Andika because he produces really nice short videos about his activity and research so is very good science communicator. So I recommend that if you're interested in these topics, but then basically with DNA, we managed to, ex to find a lot of interesting things. You know, the first thing was very easy uh, and it was over 10 years ago when we first started doing this using analyzing DNA samples from uh, fillets of fish in Dublin. And we found out that one in four cod was not cod. And so a lot of the puns were published in the, in the websites. We actually found that thanks to European regulations, actually the number of mislabeled, you can see here in red, a number of mislabeled fish that were probably fraudulently labeled as something else. In Europe, they were not so much, not so many. But we also found that there was uh, a threat of less commonly traded fish, fish that are not well known, as we have seen, and as we have said, a lot of fish are not even known. We, we, the, the average consumer has no way out of all these thousands of fish where they're coming from and what they do. For example, some of these fish are traded under umbrella term, for example, tuna or shark or ray or, for example, snapper. And if you go in, in food stores uh, across the, the United Kingdom, for example, you will find stuff that is traded as snapper. It's, it's a commonly attractive name. And, uh, and don't worry about the small prints and things, but essentially when we sampled snappers in Canada, in the United States, in the UK, in Australia, we detected using DNA that actually there were more than 60 different species of fish. That, could, that were traded as snappers. And some of them were not even biological snappers because snappers should be only used for a certain family of fish. And, and, and they were coming from all over the world. And there was no way any consumers in one of these cities, in one of these places would have any idea where this fish is coming from. And this is very problematic because if we don't know where the fish is coming from, we cannot make any choice if we want to consume it. We want to instead know exactly what fish it is, where it comes from, what type of fishery it's coming from. Is that a fishery that is uses a management, a fish that is 
making sure that only the amount of fish that can be caught are being caught and traded? Is it a fishery that it complies with uh, environmental standards and also human rights standards? Um, and it's very important that we know exactly what ends up on our plate. And DNA is giving us this agile technology that we can apply at all the, the level of the supply chain. Another example I want to tell you about umbrella, umbrella terms, which are these terms that under, under, under which umbrella many different species could be traded as because there is no check. And traditionally, they're just be called, they are called with these generic names. So grouper is another attractive fish, but there are more than, than 200 different species potentially in the sea that could be called groupers. And this is a story, uh, a collaboration that we did with a, uh, on a Caribbean island called Turks and Caicos. So in, in, in this place, which it, obviously like many places in the Caribbean, they are also popular for tourism. And there are some resorts that serve locally caught grouper. Uh, first of all, the most popular grouper in that area is a highly endangered species, is the Nassau grouper, which actually has certain periods of the year you cannot catch them. So we actually went there to see whether there were some illegally caught Nassau groupers in, in those restaurants, which actually, actually they charge enormous amounts of money for often rich tourists. Um, we never found Nassau grouper. And in fact, the majority of fish that were being sold, often at 50, 60, 70 dollar proportion, were not even groupers. And the vast majority, as you can see from this gray segment, was a fish called Panganos, Panganosianodon hypophthalmus, which can be called Panga or Pangasius, or river cobbler, or Bassa. And you can find this in Tesco or in any uh, major supermarkets. And it's commonly traded. It's farmed in Southeast Asia. It's a freshwater fish and it's actually quite cheap. So the fact that there were these hotels and resorts selling a uh, locally caught grouper that was in fact actually a farmed freshwater fish from Southeast Asia is extremely worrying, especially because all this premium and this money that we're making was not trickling down to the local fishermen in Turks and Caicos there because they were completely cut out of the business. And so there is another dimension that we have to consider with fisheries, also the value chain, how the business is, is going to be carried out in a way that there is a fair distribution of resources. And, and this is an important aspect that we should consider also, not just the diversity or in, in the biological diversity. Um, of the organisms that are caught. And I am coming to, to my end, uh, to the end of this uh, brief talk, and I want to maybe highlight four points for the future. Um, this is not just four points for the future in general, but also it could be a glimpse of what your career could be. Because if you choose to go into a biological, marine biology, broadly speaking, there are so many different lines of activity that you could really realistically be involved in uh, in your in your adult working life uh, if we want seafood we want sustainable fisheries and we want healthy ecosystems so if you study biology or marine biology or zoology or wildlife conservation then you will have an employment in this field but also you can have a more technical interest in developing and improving genetic dna testing we have seen the picture of Andika doing those tests in Indonesia, that is the same equipment that is used to test people for COVID. So that is a very widely used technology because every organism on this planet has DNA. So that is a very universal way of screening biodiversity. And then also we can go beyond biology because conservation and management requires more than biology. So it requires sitting around tables with social scientists, with economists, and, and understanding this complex supply chain really doesn't only have biological drivers, but also has to respond to the, the laws of markets, and it has to comply with policy. And so there is a lot of improvement that can be done from the policy side and the socioeconomic analysis. Finally, 
science communication and education. If you want to be, if you're good at teaching things, if you want, if you like communicating uh, things, then we should all get together and educate people about seafood because I hope that even though with this small snippet of information today, you are now beginning to understand how, how diverse seafood is and how important it is, where it comes from and what are the challenges and the issues pertaining to in each individual species that is caught and produced and distributed. And with this, I am thanking you so much for giving me the, this opportunity and please follow the Mariani Lab. It's not all technical, it's not all academic, it's not all nerdy. There are a lot of videos and communications and, and feel free to really follow us and to get in touch if you wanna learn more. So thank you so much, bye-bye. Thank you very much for that, Stefano. That was incredibly insightful and really, really fascinating to, to watch and learn so much more about seafood. If you're watching at home, uh, thank you very much for joining us live. And if you're watching on demand, then we hope that you enjoyed that whenever you are watching it. We do have a load more sessions uh, coming up through this Lightning Lunch series. And tomorrow we are joined by experts from public slash environmental health uh, on the 11th of May for one more session on this uh, topic. So if you really enjoyed that session as much as I did, please do come back and uh, watch that session. If you are watching on demand, then we hope you enjoy that. But from both of us, that will be the end. If you do have any questions, you can contact us at outreach at lgmu.ac.uk. So have a lovely afternoon, everyone. Bye-bye.